Okay, so I have uh, turned the recording on and we're going to get our class uh, started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting to the class. I think the others will join us. We will get started. Um, I have also um, put out a PDF, yes, on the um, coursework section, the uh, classwork section for in Google Classroom. Um, you can download that, uh, use that as a reference, as a guide. Okay, let's pray and we'll get started. Um, so Dave, would you please like to lead us in prayer and then we will get started. Sure. Father, we thank you and we glorify you for this day, Lord Jesus. Especially we thank you for this time as we go into our classes, Lord. We pray that you give us your understanding, Lord Jesus. Whatever our pastor is teaching us, Lord Jesus, so that we can understand it, Lord Jesus, so that we can know it, and so that we can apply it in our upcoming days, Lord Jesus. At least one of us to understand everything, Lord Jesus. I submit our pastor and I submit every student into them. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Good. So, thank you. Let's uh, do a quick review of where we, of uh, things we've covered. So we are now in this course on urban church planting. We are um, in our second sec section where we are talking about the practical aspects of uh, urban church planting. Just looking at it, you know, how do you go about doing this uh, practically? And so uh, I just want to quickly review. Uh, some of the things uh, that we have mentioned, and then we will go forward from there, All right? So I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, screen, share the PDF that uh, that all of you have, um, and uh, we will go forward from there. All right, so we started talking about the practical aspects of urban church planting. Um, we um, mentioned, we discussed a little bit, I've shared with you about the church planting core team. It's good always to have a core team together uh, when you're going out to start a church or start any ministry. Uh, so although you know in this course we're talking about church planting, you could apply it to any other kind of Christian ministry in an urban context. So it's always good to have a church planting core team so that you could work together and be a support to each other. Uh, we've talked about how you can start preparing from a distance, even before you actually go into that city or that place where you want to, uh, where you're planning to do a ministry, uh, do the ministry, plant a church, or start the ministry. You can prepare from a distance. Uh, we talked about, you know, at some point you will have to relocate to the site. You will have to relocate to that particular part of the city where you want to uh, start your ministry. Um, also, we talked about you know, how do you plan for your finances, uh, your personal finances and the finances that you need to do the work, you know, whether it's a church plant or to start um, the ministry. So it's good to plan these things ahead of time um, before you uh, get on the ground. Uh, then also think ahead for, for other personal needs um, that may arise uh, in the journey that you're making whether it's for family members, whether it's for children, our uh, children, so on. Um, also, I need to think about the uh, legal and the administrative side of things, uh, because uh, when you're planting a church, when you're starting a ministry, uh, that also must be covered. And we are dealing with that part in a separate course uh, in church and ministry administration, you know, all the, the nitty gritties of uh, running a Christian organization, a church, or a Christian ministry. So uh, that's the preparing, prepare, uh, preparation that we do. Then once we are ready to you know, get into some serious work, uh, one of the first things that we encourage you to do is to survey the city. Right? And uh, uh, on the coursework and uh, the classwork in Google Classroom, uh, I've given you a sample survey so I'm just going to run through this sample survey. Uh, this was actually done in 2014, you know, so it's it's a little dated, 
uh, it's you know about six seven years old um, but uh, the format of it is something you could follow for the cities the places where you are living or for the places where you're planning to go and start to work uh, so you can just follow this kind of a format and uh, you know uh, it's good probably to do something like this maybe every 10 years uh, because like we mentioned you know uh, the city itself is dynamic things change uh, so a research that we did in the beginning of the decade maybe 10 years later there would be some you know uh, changes uh, that ha that have taken place in the city and so it's good to keep you know doing the survey uh, periodically uh, so that we stay up to date on you know what's going on in the city maybe every 10 year period is something uh, useful to do uh, you know so uh, let's look at what this survey looks like so actually this is um, part of the appendix so what we did was we looked at uh, uh, all the major cities across india uh, so we said okay what are all the cities and this was back in 2014 based on the 2011 census um, that um, uh, there are uh, at least 53 indian cities cities in india with more than 1 million residents, or that you would say an Indian uh, Indian uh, numbering system would be more than 10 lakh <laughs> um, uh, with uh, 1 million residents. So we listed out all of these cities and uh, you can see Bangalore is uh, somewhere up in the top number five um, in terms of uh, approximately 8 million. But I, you know, the actual numbers could be much higher you know, uh, people say it's about 12 million or so. Uh, and one is because uh, this is 2011 census, it's 10 years old, and um, things have, you know, the city keeps growing. Um, so we, you know, you've got a list of, we got an idea, okay, these are all the cities. So if you're looking at urban ministry in India, you know, obviously you want to target all the, the cities uh, over time. Now, here's a sample uh, a survey of a city so this was a sample survey of bangalore city it was done uh, 2014 and again it's not a in-depth uh, study of every aspect of the city but it gives you a survey meaning a high level view so you get a sense of you know these are things that are in the city uh, and like we said in the in the in the earlier uh, you know in, in our section one that when you get to understand the physical dynamics of the city uh, god put certain things in your heart uh, he and also you, you're able to position yourself correctly in the city so that you can reach people that god wants you to go uh, and minister to so you know you, you do a little bit of background information on the city you understand what's happening from a civic point from a government uh, point of view uh, uh, and uh, you know what are the you know uh, infrastructure wise what are some of the challenges in the city the slums uh, the pollution um, understand the economy of the city where is it where is it coming from uh, of course Bangalore is known for its IT um, companies understand a little bit about the demographics of the city you know the you know, the mix that we have here uh, the culture of the city um, and then the social geography of the city uh, so you can understand the major religions uh, religious groups in the city uh, then you understand the socioeconomic issues so in the quality of life uh, what is happening uh, in the life of the city so i'm just giving an idea you can do this for your own city the city where you are targeting right uh, what does the cost of living look like it is a cosmopolitan city we have a lot of uh, foreigners here in the city um, and uh, you know at that time we highlighted African students now this has changed somewhat uh, but there was a time when we had a lot of students from Africa coming and studying here in Bangalore uh, we look at the moral values of the city what's going on in terms of uh, uh, the moral consciousness of the city uh, some of the major influencers uh, in this area uh, the art of living program uh, the pub culture uh, in, in Bangalore City, uh, what's happening here in this area, uh, and the gay population, the addictions that are people struggling with in, in the city, um, uh, what is the standing of women, how are they being treated, what's happening to them, 
the disabled population, senior citizens, what's happening among the young people, the youth, uh, other, other challenges that the city is facing, human trafficking, bonded labor, uh, children, women workers, what is the state of unemployment, um, the suicide rate, again, this is something uh, uh, significant as far as Bangalore City is concerned. Uh, female suicides, of course, corruption, uh, crime rate, what's happening here, crime against women, rape cases, acid attacks, something about the prison system. There are people who are working in the prisons as well. Uh, other things that we would want to look at, accident rate and education, again, is a very important area. So that, uh, uh, you know, because if that's where you're targeting young people, you need to know uh, distribution of education institutions across the city. So that's they're just a listing by, by different areas of the city. Similarly, we have a listing of uh, uh, IT companies. Sorry, this is a long list here. Just going through it quickly. Uh, major industries. Oh, yeah, you can have okay by area. What are the main industrial areas um, in the city, right? So this is a sample survey document. You know, uh, so it's about twenty pages long, uh, but it gives you. You know, when you do that exercise, it kind of gives you a feel like okay, I kind I, I kind of know my city to some degree. Right? And of course, it's not everything that's going on in the city, but it helps us understand some of the key things, uh, at least when we are beginning to uh, do the ministry, we know, you know these are things that we need to be addressing, or the Lord may lead you uh, to address it. So survey the city, and this, that was just a sample of uh, Bangalore City. Uh, we mentioned you know, how Paul, when he was at Philippi, he spent time looking at the city. We read from Acts 16, you know, how he went about the city and then because he you know would have spent time in the city he found out that there was a prayer group happening outside the city uh, by the river and so one sabbath he goes out there and he meets the people and actually the ministry takes off from that uh, group same thing at athens you know we see that paul spent some time by himself just going around the city uh, getting a feel of what's happening in the city and from there, you know, things begin to um, unfold for him in the city. So take the time to understand the city. And like I said, you know, we may need to keep looking at the city. Uh, I mean, doing a survey like this, uh, uh, probably, you know, every 10 years or so. So we get a fresh uh, uh, vision for the city and also an understanding of what is happening uh, in the city because things are constantly changing. Uh, both in the physical and the spiritual realms over the city. Now, having done that, we said the next thing is for us to identify the launch area. You know, uh, so that means where are you going to start your work, right? Uh, so the city itself is so big. You know, so Bangalore City, uh, it is so big, more than 12 million people, and the city is expanding. Uh, and uh, technically, I mean, you could just go anywhere and start a church because the need is so great. Uh, it's true that in Bangalore City, you know, we may be having more than a thousand churches, but uh, it's we still need more churches in the city because the city is so big. You know, uh, you have uh, 12 million people or, or and growing, and then you have so many different uh, groups, language groups, uh, people who have come into the city from various parts of India, so they're all speaking different languages. Uh, you have different socioeconomic groups uh, based on their uh, labor and the work they're doing in the city. So the city is so diverse. So even though, you know, we may say, you know, at this time, we have about a thousand plus churches in Bangalore, uh, we need even more. We probably need another 20, 30,000 churches uh, in the city because there are so many people in the city. So uh, so when you come in, so when you are sent into a city, it's important to find the place where you're going to do the church plant or where you're going to start the ministry. Right? Um, 
so doing the survey is in some way going to help you understand where you're going to start and of course you're also listening to god you know based on the doors he opens the people he connects you with uh, and so on so you're doing your survey but you're also listening to god and expecting god to lead you to the right place in the city uh, where you should start the ministry um, why is this so important um, because uh, there are a couple, uh, several reasons. Well, I mean, okay, I guess uh, let me just touch upon so uh, a few things here. So while you're going about deciding where to start, be sensitive to what God is already doing in the city, right? So we mentioned this last time. Uh, be sensitive to what is what God is already doing. Don't try to go too close to a, 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 a church that was very similar to what you you're going to be doing, right? There's there's no point in you know being on the same street or close to each other i mean if if you're kind of doing the same kind of ministry uh, i mean if it's a different language if it's a different um socio socioeconomic group if it's a different uh, target audience you know, then, then it's fine but if, if you're doing exactly or something same or similar to another church it's kind of odd if you're so close to them right so be sensitive you know if, so you know try to in it necessarily space space out your work uh the other thing we said is as you're lo looking at the launch area talk to some other christian leaders and organizations that are there it's good to meet with them introduce yourself to them build friendships uh, let them know that uh, you're not coming there to disrupt anything that god is already doing you're not coming there to you know uh, take people up from their congregations you're not coming there to compete uh, we're all there to complement each other Okay. So just, you know, have a good relationship. But this is also important for the long term uh, as we work in a city. So uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we need to keep in mind uh, uh, is as you are planning on the uh, launch area is uh, to position it strategically, right? That means, uh, especially now, let's say if you're talking about a church location, position it where it's close to your target audience or where it is accessible to your target audience. Now, of course, you know, uh, if your target audience are people who have vehicles, you know, cars or bikes or whatever, usually they will take, you know, they will travel uh, some considerable reasonable distance to come to that church. Um, because of you know the connect they have um, and because of the way you would minister to them uh, but otherwise if your target audience are people who you know who are dependent on public transport for example then then you need to you know be close to a public transport uh, line so that you know people can easily come and go from your location so you know if you're far away from a uh, from you know, so accessibility is is an important thing Right. So these are all practical things, but they do make a difference, especially when you go about inviting people to come. Uh, you know, uh, these are practical things. They're going to ask, "Oh, where where are you meeting?" And you say, "I'm meeting here." Or if they if they don't have you know a way to access come there, then they will not be able to come and be a part of uh, the church services or the ministry that you're doing. Right. Uh, the other thing is. Uh, uh, you know, if you're reaching young people, you want to be where the young people are close to them, you know, whether it's a school, the college or the malls or the pubs or the coffee shops or, you know, where, where, where things are going on. Or if you're, if you're targeting business people, then and, and you're doing something in the weekday, in the maybe lunch hour or, you know, something like that, then obviously you want to be where the people are, which is, you know, in the tech parks, in the business centers, the business districts. Um, you want to be there because that's the kind of ministry you're planning to do. Uh, or if you are, you know, re, you know, wanting to work with, uh, 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 let's say, uh, homemakers, well, then you can, you know, be in a, some sort of a residential area where, um, you know, homemakers who have free time in the afternoons or uh, they can come over to your your center and you know experience the ministry that you have for them so uh, understand your launch area because and position yourself so that 
uh, you know, you can, the people that you're going to minister to will be able to come to uh, where you are uh, providing the ministry, okay? And, uh, and understand, uh, you know, keep, keep accessibility in mind. Now, once you've, uh, you know, you're doing that during a survey phase, you're looking at your launch area, you're thinking about it. Uh, uh, so you're going to get prepared to do the launch. So before you actually do the launch, there's a preparation for the launch. Uh, we call it uh, some, you know, the pre-launch phase or the preparation phase here. So sometimes, you know, uh, you know people may have pre-launch meetings. That means they haven't officially launched the church, uh, the church in terms of the services, but uh, they may, uh, for a period of time, maybe six months, I, I know of some people who have done it for two years, uh, where they have pre-launch meetings. That means they are kind of engaging with their target audience in some other format, you know, uh, before they can officially launch the church. Uh, now, they may do it for several reasons. One is for them to understand the terrain, that is the people that they're going to reach out to, get to un get a feel of the city, and also to to maybe to build the initial core team up. You know, so, you know, you go through a pre-launch phase. Now, so this is not a requirement. This is not something you have to do, but it's just an idea. Sometimes you may want to do it just to help you prepare for the launch, right? So you can think about it. Um, another thing that usually happens during the pre-launch phase or preparation phase is time that is spent in worship, prayer, and intercession. So uh, the core team may be on site and they may spend three months, they may spend six months, just you know, um, getting to know the terrain, doing the survey, looking for the launch area and um, surveying the city. At the same time, they're just engaging in worship, prayer, and intercession before God in the city, right? So that's also a good thing because, you know, there, through that time of worship, prayer, and intercession, spiritual things are happening. God can speak, God can guide, uh, God, uh, you know, God is uh, uh, causing that group to be spiritually ready and also to, you know, prepare things spiritually for the launch. So uh, worship, prayer, and intercession, some groups may do that. They may spend, you know, three to six months just in worship and prayer uh, before the launch. So during the uh, this pre-launch phase, this preparation phase, like I said, um, uh, identify your primary target audience. Uh, so you say, well, I'm going to reach young people uh, or English-speaking professionals or English-speaking married couples. Uh, you know, whatever your target audience is, you know, whatever God has called you to do in that city. So under you know, identify where are they? Where are they? in the city, uh, try to understand their needs. Uh, what are their needs? Because uh, whatever ministry you do or we do, uh, we have to help serve people. And one of the ways we serve them is by meeting their recognizable needs. Now, I'm not saying we have to meet all their needs, but you know, at least if you're addressing one or two important needs, uh, it gives us a point of, uh, point to interact with them and say, look, this is where we have come to serve you. So let's say, for example, uh, uh, if we are targeting uh, young professionals in the city, okay, what are their needs? Uh, uh, they want to, you know, of course, uh, they have all the things that are going on in their workplace. Now, uh, many of them, young professionals, will be stepping out of singlehood into marriage. You know, they're transitioning. They have transitioned from college into the workplace. And uh, you know, they're just starting up the career, the young professionals. Many of them will also transition from singlehood to being married. Um, so that's one area of need where, you know, uh, about this whole thing about finding a life partner or finding uh, understanding, you know, preparing for marriage. That's an area of need. Um, what else would they have? Uh, well, once they get married, you know, how do I have a good marriage? So understanding, you know, what, what it takes to build a good married life 
is another area of need. Some other areas of need is, you know, how do I manage money? So I've just started making money. How, or how do I manage my finances? Um, uh, you know, uh, how do I save money? How do I get out of debt? How do I invest for the future? So that's another area of need uh, that you know young professionals may have. Uh, and some of them may already be looking at how do I make sense of my faith in my working life? So they were in college, they were focused with studies and things of that nature. But now you've come into a working place, you're busy with work, but you know some of them may already be people in the faith so their ish challenges, how do I make my faith relevant to my workplace and in my workplace? So that's again another area of need. So uh, another important area of need is uh, learning how to balance uh, life. Me, they work life, uh, then you know they're getting married. So the married life, they may have children. So. How do you manage all of that? So understanding how that work-life balance is done is again another area of need. So what I'm saying is, suppose you understand whom you're going to minister to, then you also understand, you understand their needs. Therefore, you know that as part of the ministry, whether it's a local church or whatever the ministry is that is reaching out to young professionals, you need to be able to address at least some of their needs. Right? So if you look at APC as a church, you will find that, hey, we are doing something for working professionals. We are talking about, uh, you know, preparing for marriage. We're talking, we have provision for uh, those who have been married who need counseling, who need help. Uh, we have, you know, we do financial planning workshops. Um, uh, of course, it's it's done by people who are, uh, chartered accountants, those who are those who know how to do that. Uh, so, or we have parenting workshops. You know, so you say, like, why are you doing these things? Because these are real needs by people whom we are serving. And so, as we provide this kind of ministry, they know that uh, we, you know, th this church is is serving certain needs that we have, and therefore. It's a they're they begin to open up, they begin to receive, and from there we help them in the journey of faith, right? So understanding the, the needs of your target audience is important so that you will be able to uh, meaningfully address some of their needs, not all, but at least some of their needs, you'll be able to serve them that way. Okay. So take time to understand your target audience, be be attentive to their needs. Uh, identify ways to connect with your target audience. How are you going to uh, connect with these people that you are targeting? Right? So if it's young professionals, you know, uh, how are you going to connect with them? Maybe maybe starting out workplace groups would be useful. Maybe providing teaching for them uh, so they can come they can come and listen to. Maybe starting these small groups. Uh, that they can come and be a part of. So different ways, you know, how are you going to connect with them? How is the church or the ministry that you're doing going to make that contact with them? And it's not just, you know, a, a one-time contact, but you want to establish connect so they can be a re relationship building. So you can come up with various ideas. And we will talk about some of these things uh, more specifically a little later on, right? Now, uh, why is it, this whole thing about target audience. Why is that? You know, uh, some people don't like that because they say, well, Jesus said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. So, you know, we can just go and minister to everybody and anybody. Well, uh, why should you understand? And why should you be thinking about your target audience? Yes, it is true that as a local church, we will serve anybody and everybody. We are not holding back the gospel from anybody or uh, you, you know as a ministry of course if somebody comes to you, you will share the gospel with whoever comes but even as a ministry uh, God gives you a focus you know serve young people serve married people serve you know whatever the, the focus 
that God has given you. So how do we justify something like that? How do we justify a target audience or a focus audience? Well, we, we, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, uh, when he initially sent out his disciples, he sent them specifically to the Jewish people, Matthew 10, 5 and 6. He said, go to the Jewish people. Now, at that time, that was God's program. At that time, that's what he wanted them to do. Now, of course, later on, he said, you know, after his, uh, just prior to his ascension, he said, go to the whole world, but start off with Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost part. So there was a progression of expanding. And surely, you know, any ministry will grow and expand. But you're starting off with a focus. You're starting off in Jerusalem, moving on to Judea, moving on into Samaria, and then moving on to the uttermost parts of the earth. So you're starting off with an initial focus. So uh, we, we need to move with God. And maybe the first thing God says is focus on these people. Start here. You also must understand uh, an element of calling. right? So when you think about Paul and Peter, uh, Paul was an apostle. Peter was also an apostle. Both were apostles. But the Bible tells us in Galatians 2, verse 7 and 8, that God appointed Peter as an apostle to the Jews. And Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, you know, we may think that Paul being a, I mean, both Paul and Peter were Jews, but Paul being a very, you know, educated man, and he knew the Old Testament, maybe he could really work with the Jews. But God said, Paul, I want you to go to the Gentiles. That's my assignment for you. That's your primary. Of course, he preached to the Jewish people. Of course, he went and preached in synagogues and all that. But his main call, his assignment was, you are an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, you are an apostle to the Jews. Right. So God places certain kinds of people connected to your life. These are the people he wants you to primarily serve. That doesn't mean you cannot serve other people. Paul did, Peter did, but primarily, right? So for yourself and for your ministry, your church, understand who is God calling you to serve? Primarily, your target audience. You will definitely expand to others, but this is your initial target. You're working with them. Who has God called you to? Because remember, along with the calling, that's where the grace and the anointing uh, is. That, that's where God will really uh, cause you to flourish, right? So understand that. So I'm just, I was just giving a little spiritual side to this whole aspect of target audience. Okay. Let me just pause here and see if uh, anybody has any questions on this. Uh, this whole thing about, uh, you know, um, targeting your audience, and so on. Uh, all right, Manu, I see your comment there that Neelam is not able to join. Can you just tell her to join? Uh, I mean, I was uh, looking at the PDF, so yeah. Any questions uh, uh, about this whole uh, thing of, uh, you know, target audience and um, understanding them, identifying their needs? so that we could plan and uh, you know plan the ministry to meet those needs any questions on that anybody okay uh, everybody everyone's with me so far okay okay so let's move on. I see your responses on the chat. Thank you. Let's move forward then. Right. So as you kind of understand your target audience, their needs, you know, it'll help you think through on the kinds of ministries you will be doing, you know, in time to come once you launch. Also, uh, the other thing is. Uh, as you are preparing for the launch, you're you know you're on the ground, you're doing the survey, you're 
maybe doing some other pre-launch activities. Um, you're looking at your target audience. You're looking at where you should, you know, what is the right place to get things started. Uh, as you're doing that, uh, you also need to look at people whom God has already prepared. Usually, that is uh, something very uh, wonderful to see. Uh, you know, Jesus said, uh, let's, let's read Matthew 10, 11 to 14. This is instructions he gave um, to his uh, 12 disciples when he first sent them out. And it's an interesting um, uh, part of uh, the instructions he gave to them uh, as he sent them out. So could somebody read Matthew 10, 11 to 14 for us, please? Matthew 10, 11 to 14. All right, let me just see. I think somebody's trying to come into the class. All right. Um, I think Neelam is trying to join in. Okay, anyway, could somebody read Matthew 10, 11 to 14, please, in the meantime? Matthew 10, 11 to 14. Kiran? Yes, sir. Now, whatever city or town you enter, in, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And, and when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Really? Yeah. Thank you. So let me just go back to the notes here. So Jesus is giving instructions to his disciples. He's saying, you know, when you go into a city, uh, you, you see who in it is worthy, uh, you know, Maybe it is the leader of the city, an important person. And of course, in those days, cities were very small compared to cities of our, our, our times. But he's saying, you know, you go there, you stay there. And the point I want to highlight is there will be people who welcome you. There may be people who don't welcome you. Right? And the simple message Jesus is giving is go where you're welcomed. There will be people who don't welcome you. Just let it be. Leave it. Shake off the dust of your feet, uh, off the feet of your feet, and go on. That means don't let that affect you. Right? You go on your mission. So same way during your uh, pre-launch phase, you know, survey phase, as you're moving about, getting to know, there will be people who welcome you. There will be people who don't welcome you. you know, they, they don't want you around. But don't let that disturb you. Go where you're welcomed. And as you're moving among the people whom you, God has, you know, who, whom God has prepared, uh, and uh, they are, they are, you know, they're excited about what you've come to do. They're excited about the vision. They're excited about, you know, the church you're going to start or the ministry you're going to plant in the city. You know, they will become part of what God wants to birth through you. You know, they will step into it. Um, and uh, not only that, they may even open doors for you. So, for example, uh, we have an Acts 16, which we read. Uh, when when Paul, Paul and his team were in Philippi for some time, and then they heard that there's a prayer group meeting outside near, uh, by the river. They went there, and they met Lydia. And the scriptures tell us that God had hope opened her heart. So if you... Go with me to Acts 16, and that's that's an interesting thing to look at. Acts 16, and uh, uh, verse, um, yeah, verse 14. Acts 16, verse 14. It says, "A certain woman named Lydia heard us." Acts 16, verse 14. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So the Lord opened her heart. So 
God was orchestrating something, right? And God opened her heart. And then this woman opened her home to Paul and his team, right? And uh, it says in the next verse, she begged us saying, you know, you come and stay with me in my house. And so, you know, God just opened her heart and she opened her home and ministry started unfolding like that in Philippi. So I'll be open to those kinds of things. As you're surveying, you know, God will bring people across your path. Uh, there'll be people who welcome you, people who understand your vision, we want to be a part of it, uh, people whose, whose heart is stirred, and they will say, hey, I want to be part of what you're doing, right? Now, when we started, when we came back to Bangalore, this was, uh, of course, uh, uh, almost 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, uh, in January of 2001, uh, when we were going to start All People's Church here in Bangalore, uh, you know, uh, um, I had been away from Bangalore for 10 years, so I'd lost a lot of contacts and people and didn't know many people. Uh, we, you know, uh, uh, sent out flyers. Uh, we distributed handbills in the neighborhood uh, where my father's house was. That's where we were going to start. And uh, we also had a few addresses of people. I didn't know if the addresses were valid or not, but we just uh, mailed out these things, invitations, that uh, just announcement that we are going to start the church. And... Uh, so this was February 18th, 2001, Sunday. So very first Sunday, we said, we're going to launch the church. We didn't know what to expect. Of course, our, uh, uh, Amy and I and our family of four and dad and uh, a few people were there. We were there. So we had everything ready Sunday, first service. And just before the service could start, in walks um, a friend of mine. His name was Georgie. George K. Sam and his wife Joyce, and they had a little daughter at that time. Uh, and so they just walked in. And, you know, I hadn't been in touch with Georgie for almost more than 10 years, I guess. I hadn't been in touch with him. And here he comes walking into the home. And I was so surprised. But it was like as though two good friends were meeting. You know, it was. Uh, it was just like an immediate connect. You know, it was like, wow, Georgie, you know, so good to see you. Because when we were in school, Georgie used to play the guitar and sing, and we did, you know, some things together. And so it was just amazing how, you know, I, I don't even know the details of how they heard that we were launching the church, and they decided that they were going to come. And they're not you know, uh, they had been making, making their own spiritual journey at the time. And they decided, we, did, we had no direct contact, so to speak, at that time, you know. And they came and they were, you know, Georgie was uh, one of our worship leaders along with Amy in those days. And so, and they helped, you know, they were part of the, the church trust when we formed it in 2001. And so I can only say that God orchestrated it because of our own efforts, we would not have known that family was, you know, where to meet them, etc. And, uh, you know, God put it in their heart to come. They came. And so like that, we started. Right? And because we already had, uh, you know, back in school days, we had good friendship. It was so easy to, you know, just go on and, and, and get started and do things together. So uh, just be open. You know, you never know how and whom God has already picked out, you know, to come and be a part of what you're going to do in a certain city. God will be there to guide you. But of course, you've got to uh, discern and avoid people who come to be a part of what you're doing with wrong motivation intentions. Now, especially if you're starting a local church or a Christian ministry, there may be people who are very zealous spiritually. Uh, they may be very zealous uh, you know, or they may even be uh, spiritually strong, but their motivation and intention in wanting to come and be a part of what you're doing may be wrong. Right? Um, they may be wanting to come because they want a position. They want to become a, a pastor in the church, or they want to be, you know, have a leadership role in the church. And, uh, uh, you know, so 
they may come with that kind of intent. They may come with that kind of motivation. And it's dangerous to, you know, to give them that kind of an opportunity because things can go wrong. Their intent in coming to be a part of that pioneering group uh, is primarily to have position, to have leadership, to have opportunity. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong if they, have, they want to serve, but they want to lead. They want to be you know, in that position, leadership position. And those are wrong motivations, wrong intentions. You got to be careful about and avoid. So uh, you have to be discerning about that. And you have to be tactful in how you handle those people. You know, you, you can't, you can't necessarily tell people not to come to church or not to come to your service or come to the, you know, the work you're doing. They're welcome, but don't give them the role a leadership role. Don't hand it to them. You know, just let it take time. If it's going to take two or three years, it's okay. Let them just be there. Uh, give them uh, things to serve, you know, just without role, without position, because that will be a real test to see if their intent in wanting to be part of what you're doing is because of their desire for position, or is it because they really just want to be a part and serve wherever, you know? So take the time. It's two, three years, it's okay. You know, but you, you need to see what's in the heart before you can entrust them. So be discerning and avoid the people with wrong motivations and wrong intentions. Right? So having done all of this, let me just uh, 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 mention, you know, what we've been talking about. So identify your launch location. So through the pre-launch phase, you would have arrived at, okay, you know, this is where we're going to start. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, we're, we're going to have our church services. As we said earlier, make sure it's easily accessible to people. And I'm just, you know, making a few things uh, explicit. Uh, make sure the place is clean and suitable for the kind of people you're reaching, you know, that they should be comfortable there. Uh, you know, what are the facilities that you need, whether it's parking, restrooms, things. Uh, if you're starting in, in your own house, uh, you could start in your home, you can move later to an auditorium, or you can launch directly in a hall or auditorium. There is, you know, whatever works, uh, there is no set formula. Uh, if you're going to rent, make sure you have a, uh, uh, a rental agreement in place and make sure that you clearly state that the space is going to be used for church gathering. You don't want to be, a, you know, a disturbance to other people if you're going to have worship and music happening uh, in a commercial uh, center. Um, and, and, or if you're in a, in a home area or in a res residential area, make sure that it's not troublesome to neighbors in that area. Now, these are just minor things, but uh, uh, these could become problems uh, later on if you don't pay attention to them before you launch. Right? Think about these things, because suppose you 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 know you launch and then you, the uh, the worship and the music is disturbing neighbors. They will raise objections. Uh, at that time, you can't call it persecution. You just have to say, hey, we are being a nuisance here, so we need to move out, you know. So it's better to think about these things before you start. Uh, lastly, and I just want to share this uh, uh, this little uh, set of ideas from Tim Keller. Uh, so he talks about uh, five principles. We're doing a church plant in an urban context. He says, you know, we need to live in the community we need to learn the community. We need to link the ministry to the community. We need to love the community, and we need to launch in the community. So that's kind of basically what we have been uh, sharing right now. You know, you're you're getting to understand the people that you are going to be ministering to, right? So that's the essence of, uh, of what we've covered so far as you're preparing to launch the work uh, in uh, the city, a particular part of the city right so we're going to stop here for today and we will continue this tomorrow any questions any thoughts so far about what we've done um are you all with me so far you can relate to what i'm saying um now are, are you finding it uh, i mean uh, do you think it's something that is relevant um, that you can use uh, in your ministry, so on. You all with me so far? Okay. All right. I see your responses in the chat. 
Okay. Fine. So we will pause here. We'll pray. And uh, we'll continue this tomorrow, uh, just giving you some practical ideas on how to launch either the church or a ministry in an urban context. Some of the things you need to think about and prepare for. Okay. So let's close in prayer. Yeah. Um, so they've prayed. Um, Siddharth, you, uh, is your phone okay? You would be able to close in prayer? Yes, sir, sure. Great, go ahead. Oh, we just want to thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for helping us to learn the teaching that Pastor Ash has teached. Lord God, I just want to pray as we learn so many things in our college. Oh God, I pray that we give us visions. And God, help us to know what's the purpose that you have for us, Lord. And God, I pray as we continue this day, I pray that you will be with us and guide us and lead us, Lord. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you. I just uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, we'll connect again tomorrow. Take this forward. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.